Well, good morning again. If we've yet to meet, my name is Mark. I am the pastor here, and it is a delight and a thrill to be able to share with you. It's kind of dreary, wet morning. Uh, I, I know that we have quite a few of our families watching online, so uh, hey, everybody. Uh, go ahead, and if you will, just say hey to everybody in the chat if you haven't done so already, uh, but welcome. We are in the second installment of our Christmas Symbols message series. I shared last week that I got the inspiration for this really about a year ago when I saw how many people were trying to discredit and discount Christianity and the arrival of Jesus because of how so many of the symbols that we use this time of year actually have their roots in what is known as uh, pagan practices and things like that. Uh, all of a sudden, my mind wanted to go to a movie reference from the 80s, but I'm not going to uh, subject you to that yet. If you want to know what it is, ask me later. But anyway, so uh, uh, the whole idea about this is this is actually how Christianity spread. When the disciples went out, and I shared in the John 16 passage, Jesus talked about you're going to be scattered out. Jesus was talking about how the disciples are going to be sent out into the world to share the message of Christ and the preeminence of God over all the junk and the gunk that we experience on a daily basis. And so that was the precursor, so to speak, for what we see. And so when the disciples and the apostles went out into the other areas in Asia and in Africa and in Europe, what they were trying to do was to help people see that Jesus is real and that he helps to answer some of the questions that folks maybe had not even found the answers for yet or didn't even know the questions to ask. And so what they would do was they would show and they would share how the things that they were doing helped to speak into the reality of Christ's presence, his power, and his preeminence overall. And last week we talked about the wreath and how uh, it is circular. So to say there's no beginning or no end. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. It is to evoke imagery of the crown of thorns. And it is also made with evergreen as a way to say that Jesus is eternal and lives forever within us. And so we are turning our attention today to the Christmas tree. Now, um, for some reason I had, a, I, was, I had a picture that I took actually this morning, of our dogs in front of our Christmas tree. Uh, and I thought I uploaded it, but something happened. But it really is a perfect illustration for how I want to kick off this message today. So if you have not yet had an opportunity to pull out your follow-along notes, whether you want to look at those in the info guide, or you want to use your Hope Church Plus app, uh, those are great ways to do it. If you want to follow along, take notes, uh, the option to share at the end. But anyway, reflection questions there too. Uh, we reclaimed a long-held Jordan tradition this weekend. My birthday is uh, December 9th, so yeah, if you looked at the clock today, it was, just, it was yesterday. Anyway, and so when I was growing up, thank you, I appreciate it. I wasn't fishing for it, but maybe just a little bit, right? Oh, just a, oh you almost got it. Like Geico commercial. Anyway, so back when I was a kid, uh, and with all the stuff going on in December, my mom and dad made it a very intentional thing to make sure that I had a birthday in the midst of a very busy season. And so part of that would be to transition from December 9th until the rest of the December. We would go, as part of our birthday tradition, go pick out our favorite Christmas tree, and then we would install it or you know place it in the stand, kind of stuff, put ornaments on it. We would listen to the greatest Christmas album of all time, A Christmas Together by John Denver and the Muppets. Uh, if you need to go stream it, stream it. We listened to it last night while we decorated our tree. Uh, and it was all part of this making sure that I had the experience of a birthday because of how important life is, and our family honors birthdays greatly. And so we were sort of reclaimed that tradition last night. We set our tree up a little bit before Thanksgiving, but we really didn't have any ornaments on it. It was just to light it. There was an ornament of, I think it was Ethan's first Christmas, sitting with Santa Claus. There was an ornament that uh, helped us to remember Mia, and there was another little seashell ornament, just like three on there. Oh, and Darth Vader, of course. But anyway, so, uh, so we had these ornaments on the tree, uh, but there were just like four of them. And we have this rotating base, so it would just spin, and we would watch it. We love the glow of the lights. And then last night, we put on John Dimmer and the Muppets, and uh, we made some uh, bacon and cheese spicy fries awesome, one of my favorite dishes, and we listened to John Denver and the Muppets, we decorated our tree, and we reclaimed that tradition. One of the things that's important for me is that this year, I've really experienced it with so much just chaos in the world, is I'm craving tradition. Do you know what I'm talking about? It used to be that I, I didn't really want, you know, turkey or something like that on Thanksgiving. You know, I would, give me some chicken enchiladas, right? Uh, 
But this year I wanted it. This year I want those traditions. I'm reclaiming some of those traditions because of how important I feel. Maybe it is as I uh, begin to, uh, you know, maybe the downward slope of the last part of my life. I'm just 49. I mean, anyways, you know what I'm talking about. But, you know, I'm just becoming more mindful of how life is. And I'm finding myself craving tradition more than I, more than I ever had. And part of that was, let's decorate our tree on my birthday. It reminds me when I was just a little kid. And listening to John Denver and the Muppets and experiencing just the joy and the beauty of family. I found that I really, I'm really craving that and I'm needing that. There's a lot of darkness in the world, isn't there? And even though we had our tree up for you know, a couple of weeks with just the lights, it was really about the light that we love, the glow of the tree. We love to watch TV in the evening with all the lights off in the, in the family room except for the glow from the tree. Because of how light seems to call us and to beckon us forward. Sometimes I love the subdued room, but there's something about this time of year where we just have our Christmas tree illuminating our family room. Friends, this is all biblical. You turn your attention to our very first Bible passage, which comes from the Gospel of John, the very first five verses of the Gospel of John. It's talking about how Jesus came to be a light in the darkness. Jesus came to be a light in the darkness. And so follow along with me. In the beginning, the Word already existed. That is pointing to the eternal nature of Christ that we talked about last week, right? The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. It is all in Jesus. And then continuing, the Word was with God and the Word was God. He, speaking of Jesus, existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, of course, Jesus, And nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created. And his life brought life, I'm sorry, life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness can never extinguish it. Now that's not to say the darkness doesn't try. And one of the things that the darkness tries to do is to get us to focus on the chaos in the world. So I took this picture this morning of our Christmas tree with all the ornaments on it, with Batman and Wonder Woman and Superman and Spider-Man, as well as Hope Church ornaments and ornaments that we've received from being kids and things like that. A long, traditional spance of it. And I wanted to get this perfect picture, right, to share for church this morning, and it didn't happen, which really speaks, like I said, probably makes for a better illustration. And so uh, we have this decrepit dog. Her name is Yoshi. She is about to be 16 years old. She's deaf, practically blind, stinks all the time. (laughs) Has decided that she is beyond doing her chores outside, if you catch my drift. And so we are holding on to this ancient one. But there's still some times that we see joy in her, like when we pull out the food bowl. Or we put Millie the Golden Retriever to bed. It's like she, she lights up a whole brand new, a whole brand new way. And so she went and she got in her bed, which I have up under, right next to the tree. And then I put some treats in there, and she's like, okay, I'm fine. Just keep that blankety-blank dog away from me. I'm trying, Yoshi, I'm trying. But then here's Millie. Millie just turned a year old. And she is this giant ball of electric enthusiasm. I mean, I hear a yes over here. She is just this absolutely crazy, wide-open, enthusiastic uh, animal. And she's beginning to learn some of her manners and some of her tricks. But the problem that she has is that she can indicate that she knows what to do, which makes us realize that when she doesn't do it, she's just being obstinate. Now, our trainer says that's what's going to make her a great therapy or service dog, but I'm not paying for that, right? So I just want her to obey. And so what I really tried to do was to get the two dogs to pose in front of the Christmas tree. As long as I put a couple treats in Yoshi's bed, she was fine. But as long as Millie knew that I had treats in my hand, she was like, oh, heck no. And she was running through, running laps around the living room. And she would go up and she'd sniff Yoshi trying to get the treats out of Yoshi's bed. And then I would try to position them just right. And I'm like, I just want to take the perfect picture for Christmas in my Facebook page and worship this morning. An Instagram moment, right? So often when we look at our traditional elements, 
things like Christmas trees and the family photos and stuff like that, we slip into the temptation of those Instagram moments, don't we, where we want to project perfection. But they're anything but. It's one of the reasons, I think, stuff like the Christmas tree is speaking to me so much this year. It's the last year in my 40s. We've had some health issues in the family. We've had some other crises in the family. And, of course, we're looking forward to an adoption, hopefully early next year. There's something about the beauty and tradition that I'm craving, and it speaks, I think, to the reality that we're looking for that light in the darkness. We're looking for peace in the chaos, hope in the crazy. And some of us are just barely getting by. Like a 16-year-old should say, as long as you give me my treats, I'm fine. And some of us are just beginning to discover the beauty and the chaos of the world. Like a one-year-old golden retriever that says, as long as I can get a treat, I'm going to run laps until you give me what I want. We find ourselves somewhere in the midst of all of this crazy. But therein lies the hope and the message of Christmas. That God came to us in the midst of our crazy, in the midst of our imperfections to show us that the perfection he wants from us is our obedience, our trust, our love. And that he gives us the light to shine into the darkness that the darkness cannot overcome. And it doesn't even understand why. And the Christmas tree becomes a centerpiece, if you will, to our experience and celebration of Christmas. I'm going to pull out a couple little points about the Christmas tree. Historically, the Christmas tree really became a thing in the 16th century in Germany. And it really was not popularized until 1847 when Queen Victoria added one to Buckingham Palace and had a celebration there. And, of course, all the pictures and all the celebrations and things began to spread. And the Christmas tree became a thing, not just in Germany and not just in England or in Europe, but it made its way over to America, to the United States in 1847. Now, if you know your history, our country was on the verge of something pretty awful, wasn't it? There are people on edge. States on edge. The nation was on edge. Hmm. It almost feels familiar, doesn't it? And the Christmas tree came to be a light in the darkness. Now, like the Christmas tree, wreath, the Christmas tree is evergreen. Which again is to remind us that Jesus is eternal. This is not a mistake that we celebrate Christmas with wreaths and trees using evergreen to remind us that Jesus is eternal. Jesus will last forever. Your chaos will not. Your crazy will not. Your imperfection will not. Your health problems will not. Your family struggles will not. Jesus is And so the tree reminds us that Jesus is eternal. And of course, one of the reasons that the Germans used the tree so much was because of its triangular shape. Have you really thought about that? Because of its triangular shape. They use this because the triangle is one of the shapes that we use to describe the Trinitarian nature of God. That God comes to us in the form of Father and Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And so the Christmas tree, in its triangular shape, whether it's 3D or 2D or whatever in between, it is to remind us that God comes to us in Father, Son, and Spirit. We look at John 1, and we look at Genesis 1, and we see how everything was made through Jesus. Nothing was made that wasn't made through him. This past week, Pastor Brent took our students through the comparison of Genesis 1 and John 1, and we looked at the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, of the Holy Trinity. Holy Spirit's part of it, right? And so the Holy Trinity comes in, and they say, let us make God, make man in our image. I probably should have had another sip of coffee before I started. Anyway, so let us make man in our image, speaking to that Trinitarian nature of God. And so we see that Jesus is the Son in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so the Christmas tree is called to invoke within us, evoke within us, imagery of the presence and the power of Christ as part of the Holy Trinity. Now, one of the things that is really cool about the German tradition was that there was a time when they actually hanged, hung their Christmas trees upside down. Have you ever seen an upside down Christmas tree? In one of the churches I served, we had uh, one of our dear matriarchal members of the church. She had an upside-down Christmas tree. And 
I would imagine she would say, well, Christmas tree and upside down. That was the way they were intended to be. They would actually hang them from the ceiling upside down in our mindset as a way to show that Christmas is about God pointing and coming to earth. Isn't that cool? I love it. And so because of her inspiration, we actually got one of those upside down Christmas trees and we added our Christmas display at the church every single year. And so the German tradition showed that the Christmas trees originally were supposed to be suspended from the ceiling as though God is coming and pointing to earth. It was also in the tradition of that that Martin Luther, who was the one who was credited with starting the Protestant Reformation, which is where our tradition comes from, is the first to put lights on the Christmas tree. Now, they weren't fancy LED ones that can change colors and blink. They were actually candles. Talk about a fire hazard. But Martin Luther was the one that had the idea of putting candles on the tree as a way to punctuate and emphatically state that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot understand it. That Christmas comes in the midst of our chaos, in the midst of our crazy, in the midst of our busyness, in the midst of our imperfections, and that light shines and the darkness cannot understand it. It is about God pointing to the earth and about God coming to the earth in the form of His Son and our Savior Jesus to say, my, my favor is with you. You crazy chaotic, imperfect people. My favor rests upon you. The message of Christmas. Jesus becomes God's gift of peace. The song that we sang before the message about how the Prince of Peace is heaven come helps us to understand this verse from Luke chapter 2 verse 14. This gift of peace is the message that the angels gave to the shepherds when Christ was born. Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. The way the Christmas narrative, my friends, plays out is extraordinary. Because the angel did not give that announcement to the religious leaders, did it? It didn't go and give the announcement to the royal authorities or the politically connected or the powerful and military. The angel came and gave that message to a bunch of lowly shepherds out in the fields tending their flock by night. And a star rose in the east, which is the fourth and final installment in our series. I don't want to jump ahead. But the star beckoned the three wise men not Jewish, not even from that area, that region, from the east. The message of Christmas is that Jesus comes not to the powerful, the connected, to those who project or present a perfect life, but those who are outside of what we believe God's family to be, and the last, the least, and the lost. Those are the ones with whom God's favor rests. Pay attention to that verse, Luke 2, 14, one more time. Because what we see and what we hear is also what we are called to feel. Glory in the highest heaven and peace on earth with those whom God's favor rests and everything in between. Friends, whether you are at your highest high right now or your lowest low, the favor of God rests on you to come and be your gift of peace 
that invades and interrupts your crazy and your chaos and your imperfection. The Prince of Heaven has come to bring heaven to us. God pointing to you and to me and to all of us that God is real and he loves us and has a purpose for our lives. Do you need the peace of Christmas today? Oh, I do. Oh, I sure do. Do we need to reclaim some of those traditions that maybe we thought were frivolous or outdated or old? I am, and I think we do. I'm concerned about the condition of our culture. As I think and pray about how God is leading and guiding and directing our preaching and teaching for 2024, the word that keeps coming to me or a phrase that keeps coming to me is hope for 24. We'll be talking more about that in the coming months. But God wants us to have hope, literally, as the church, but also figuratively that his way wins in the end. He wants us to have hope for 24. And so however it is that you are experiencing darkness in the world today, whether it's problems at work or problems at home or problems with health or problems with problems, I want you to know that Christ comes in the midst of the crazy, in the midst of the chaos, to bring light to the darkness. The Christmas tree is pointing to us and saying, God's favor is with you. And here comes heaven, folks. Jesus is coming, invading our world, invading our life, invading our darkness, and invading our chaos. We're going to close this morning a bit more subdued than usual. I want to invite Christian and Sarah to come and join me on the stage. And I want us to think about what it means for us to invite heaven into our heart and into our lives and into our church and into our community and into all creation. And yes, when we feel the darkness, we feel the crazy, we feel the chaos, and we're trying to get our dogs to pose just right in front of our tree with all of our crazy ornaments on it, to remember that heaven comes. May we prepare our lives for that today. Pray with me, please. Living and loving God, thank you for this day in the midst of this season. We thank you for your peace. We thank you for your hope. And now I pray, Lord God, that we prepare our hearts and our minds and our lives for heaven to come. To invade our souls. To invade our existences. To invade our world. And to invade history. Lord, may we be ready. For heaven is coming. May we prepare our lives accordingly. In the name of your Son and our Savior Jesus, I pray.